Um, fantastic to see so many people here today interested in following connections in ancient Egypt. It is great that tomorrow they have this study day going on. So let's say that this is the unofficial fluffy introduction uh, we do an overview in preparation for this study day. Now, this is one of the first times I've given this talk. It's quite early days here with my research into Egypt and the foreign world. Currently, I'm working on my next book, which is focusing on basically the, an overview of Egypt's foreign relations throughout the Pharaonic period. And whilst researching this book, it struck me that just how much new information has come out in the past 20 years or so about Egypt and the outside world that happened before the New Kingdom. Because normally when people talk about this type of subject, they start talking extensively about the New Kingdom and the amount of letters and the great campaigns of the New Kingdom and all of this stuff. And everything before that kind of gets uh, condensed into a tiny little paragraph or maybe half a chapter or something like this. But this has changed recently. Uh, and so you see lots of great academic publications about the outside world generally and Egypt's relations. And it's great to provide an overview of this. So I kind of regard this lecture at the moment as the uh, sort of greatest hits of the last 20 years of discoveries in, in Egypt and the outside world. Um, because it's early days for the research, the book isn't uh, really due until sometime next year. Um, there is an unfair waiting in this lecture about uh, focusing mainly on the Levant. So not so much on Nubia, uh, not so much on Libya, but mainly lots of Levantine connections that I'll be talking about. So, having said that, let's begin. So this is Egypt, which of course you all recognise. Um, it's a place that looks pretty inaccessible from the outside world some from the outside, I mean. Um, you've got the Mediterranean Sea to the north, you've got the desert, the western desert, the eastern desert, and in the south, of course, you have the quite difficult to navigate um, cataracts of the Nile. So all of this lends itself to this idea of Egypt being this place on its own, isolated, different from everything around it. And this is not something that escapes other people nearby, too. So we have the word Misa, that was the way Egypt was referred to by its neighbours, the Semitic neighbours speaking. This was the enclosed land. And it reflects nicely this idea that you get from just looking at Egypt from the outside, from space, this idea of it being separated and individual and enclosed, difficult to access and get at. And it's this particular unusual environment that created this sense of superiority that you see flowing through all the Egyptian texts. So you're not constantly seeing that Egypt, represented by the king here, is basically better than everybody else around him. And when you normally tend to see foreigners in Egyptian texts and art, they're normally being smacked over the head by someone with a very large mace, or they're chained up and being dragged along by a rope. So not a normally nice presentation, at least of the people on the outside. But it isn't really very fair because Egypt did have lots of strong connections with the outside world from the very beginning of its history. Throughout the entire Pharaonic period, in the pre-dynastic two, you're seeing people going backwards and forwards, you're seeing immigration going on, and you're also seeing lots of contacts with the Syria, Palestine, Levant, Libya, and Nubia as well. And of course, as you would expect, all of these things will impact Egyptian civilization. It does not really exist in a vacuum. Now these foreigners entered Egypt in different ways. The one we're typically finding in the text is that it's the people who were prisoners of war, people who became slaves, or who were forced, unskilled laborers for the Egyptians. These unfortunate individuals were regarded as the property of Pharaoh. They were sent to work on temple estates, or they worked for private individuals as well. And sometimes, apparently, they were branded as well. Now, sometimes if you had a special skill, you could also be used in a much better way, but I'm sure that wasn't very often. Now, generally, these foreigners living in Egypt over time will have acculturated to the Egyptian ways. So taking the Egyptian behavior and the Egyptian material culture as well and slowly disappearing into the mass of the population. We see across Egyptian history, foreigners behaving in many different ways in different occupations, so farmers, laborers, priests, cooks, barbers, shipbuilders, coppersmiths, artists, musicians, doctors, magicians, and so forth. Lots and lots of different ways that you can find work as a foreigner in ancient Egypt. 
But as I say, even this overview I'm giving now as an introduction, much of this relates to New Kingdom material, and anything that goes on before it is often not really dwelled upon, especially in books aimed at a general public, the general popular audience. Which is unfair, because lots of people in the past 15, 20 years have been doing lots of very hard work uncovering lots of great information about things that happened before that, which I think still haven't really permeated into the public mind, things that haven't really reached out enough into the general public <coughs> consciousness. And so we're going to try and fix that today. So let's start at the very beginning. We'll look at the pre-dynastic period to begin with. Now talking very generally, in this period, roughly 4000 to 3000 BC, we have, again, very generally, this division of Egypt into the lower Egyptian culture, as it tends to be referred to these days, what's also sometimes called the Mahdi Bhutto culture, culture in the north, and then the Nagadians, or Nagadans, in the south. So to start with, let's focus on the lower Egyptian culture and look at the north, because this is where quite a lot of really exciting stuff has been found quite recently. Because there are lots of sites that are being found that show the strong connections between the Levant in the pre-dynastic period and the, Le uh, the Levant and the Delta. So lots of strong connections. Now, I could have picked many different sites, but for our purposes today, to cover as much as I could, uh, we're going to look at Mahdi, first of all, very briefly, and then Tel El Farka, the, uh, I think, quite funnily named Chicken Hill. That's not the reason I picked it, but <laughs> it is one word. Um, so, first of all, to look at Mahdi. This area, which is today basically a, a suburb of Cairo in the south, this is one of the great locations where you find a lot of evidence for interactions with the Levant and Egypt in this early time. This is a site that was occupied from about 3900 BC to about 3600, 3500-ish. So what do we get there at Mahdi? Well, there's certainly lots of evidence of foreign trade goods in this very early time, particularly wood we get from the Levant, so the area of Syria and the Lebanon. More interestingly, I think you find copper fish hooks and various other copper items as well. So copper pins, copper axes, copper ingots. What's significant here is that no metal working facilities of so far have been found at Mardi, so these objects seemingly are being brought in from the outside. And Studies of the copper itself have shown that these are from a Palestinian source, and so the Egyptians are not mining the, the cyanide at the moment for the copper. They're getting it from further beyond. You also find lots of other typically Levantine objects too, so flint scrapers, Levantine blades, spindle walls, V-shaped basalt bowls, all of these things show the presence of foreigners at this site, as well as the pottery. Lots of imported pottery has been found in all the different layers of Mahdi throughout the settlement at different times. So, continuous uh, trade at least is going on. But what I find particularly fascinating about Mahdi is the way that it's one of these places where you have clear evidence of foreigners actually living there. So, you have this Palestinian style housing at Mahdi, which is quite different from the Egyptian houses in the, in the, the Delta at the time. So, the Egyptian houses at Mahdi are quite uh, different in that they have built from perishable materials, wattle and daub, above ground, whereas the Palestinian style housing is underground. These are kind of subterranean dwellings with a little roof over them supported by a column, as you can see at the reconstruction there at the bottom. Kind of underground dwelling place. What's also significant is that they are using wood bricks. Now, mud brick construction is not known at this time in Egypt, and it seems to be something that the people from the Levant are bringing in. And so they're using construction methods that Egyptians <coughs> were unaware of at this time. So bricks, mud, wood bricks and stones and so forth lining these pit dwellings. And these are quite similar to the type of <coughs> dwellings you find in the Beersheba Valley in the Levant as well. These are oval or rectangular, and just like the ones you have in Egypt, at Mahdi, they have a column to support the roof. And this is the type of thing you find. It doesn't look particularly homely, I suppose, not a place you won't spend that much time, but it does seem to be the case. This is what they were used for. Now, it seems that these, it was sometimes said that these might just be places for storage, but some of the objects you find in these subterranean dwellings indicate long-term presence. They indicate that people were living 
inside these uh, constructions. So you had pottery vessels that were in the floor, spindle walls, weaving, flint knives, and so forth. The types of things that reflect that someone would have been living in here. And so Mardi's early prosperity seems to be connected with this. It's all to do with the foreigners, with the trade with the Levant. In fact, the individuals staying in these houses perhaps acted as middlemen in this entire trade network, uh, act, uh, dealing with the Egyptians and dealing with the traders coming in. Now that's Mardi. This is quite early on. But Tel El Farka is also particularly interesting, mainly because what's been found here is very new. And these excavations have been going on very recently, and so lots of new, exciting information has been coming from this site. As you can see, its location there, the sort of central eastern delta, is also very good for trade. It's the perfect location when you're coming across the ways of Horus, across the northern Sinai coastline, and entering into Egypt. This is a nice place to stop. And Tel Farka, it's a little bit uh, later than the earliest phases of Mardi, so 3600 BC. You start getting quite a lot of evidence there for trade with the southern Levant as well. But what it seems to be is, even at this very early point, a major complex for the redistribution of goods. It's the end point and the start point of a major trade route. Now, in the earliest phase, about 3,600 BC to 3,300, you have clear occupation by this um, lower Egyptian culture. And on the western side of the site, you have what, what is, I think they, they say, the earliest, largest brewery in the world. So that's probably one thing they were exporting is beer. Um, but they also have uh, clear evidence from that phase of these connections. And this continues throughout the life of the site. So the Nagadians, when you have this spread north of the Nagada culture, uh, they take this area in about 3,300. This area where the, the clear evidence of contacts is, is destroyed. But they then build a new massive residence on the exact same spot. So they're continuing the usage of this area of the site uh, for its connection with the trade with the Levant. You find Levantine pottery in this, uh, this residence, seal impressions as well. And this too was then later destroyed by fire. And once again, they build another building on the same spot for the same types of purpose. This time it's an administrative cultic building at the end of Megala III. And you find important ceramics there once again. Clear evidence of this connection on the trade route. And in fact, you even get materials from as far away as Megiddo being evidenced at this time at the site. As far as what the the Guardians wanted from this trade, it seems that they were importing from the Levant wine, olive oil, copper, asphalt or bitumen, as well as other goods from the Levant as well. In exchange though, the Egyptians seem to have been giving them grain, uh, meat especially, we'll talk more about that in a second, and probably also beer as well, as I was saying, it's quite a large connection with beer at this site. Now, looking through the excavation, Horse. It's fun because you notice that they were finding lots of pig bones, but only the parts with the least meat, and they, they, they comment on this in the excavation report. Saying that what's going on is that the parts of the body of the pig that you would want to eat, they are probably being preserved in some way and then sent off to the Levant as part of this trade. And it's the same with fish. Despite there being a lot of evidence at the site for a sort of industrial level fishing industry, lots of copper harpoons <coughs> uh, and so forth, you don't really get much evidence for the fish themselves. And the suggestion is that just like the parts of the pigs, that they were sending fish over there too. And at about the exact same time that this is going on at Tel El Farka, you do get evidence of Nile fish in, in the Levant, so in these same layers. So there's a reasonable suggestion that from this location you're sending meat and fish to be eaten by people in the Levant in exchange for other goods. And so the excavators suggest that because of the strong ongoing connections, the importance of this site, it was probably not just a, a node along this trade route, it was probably a major point, either the beginning or the beginning and end of one of the major routes from the Levant into Egypt, and that's why this site is so important for so long. 
You can imagine then that throughout this entire phase, there must have been lots of exchanging of goods as, as well as ideas and technology. You know, people would have been interacting with each other, and so Egypt never was in a vacuum. There's always ideas being moved along, particularly from what we've just been saying, the idea that mud brick uh, construction might have entered Egypt as a result of interactions with people from the Levant. There's also the idea that writing, of course, entered uh, via the Levant into Egypt as well, but this is contested. There's lots of arguments about when the writing system was developed. Um, of course, the two UJ, the Abydos, will have uh, has influenced people's opinions on this with these new labels with uh, hieroglyphs on them. But uh, it's a possibility still that foreigners introduced writing to Egypt. Now, moving forwards a little bit and entering into the early dynastic phase, we know that the Egyptian involvement with the Levant then incredibly intensifies around 3100 to about 3000 BC. This is a time when in certain locations in the South Levant, you start getting a lot of Egyptian material focused on particular areas, and particularly in locations where previously there was no Levantine material culture. So they've taken spots, it seems, in the southern Levant at this point, and built what can be classed as Egyptian colonies. This was uh, debated for a long time, whether these colonies were real or not, or whether they were just, you know, blips in the evidence. This all changed with the excavation of Tel es Sakan in the southern uh, Levant. This is a massively fortified building made in an Egyptian style, oriented the typically Egyptian style for the phase, this phase. And it's regarded, it's, they think, as a sort of administrative center for a colony of Egyptians that were controlling the Southern Levantine trade network. So it wasn't enough anymore for them in this phase to simply be dealing with people crossing the ways of Horus, crossing the Sinai. They went out, went into the Southern Levant and took control of this trade network themselves. This is a good location for this type of endeavor. As you can see, Tel Sakan is quite close on, on the Mediterranean coastline, and it's at the end of the Sinai Road along the coastline. So it's an extremely good location to have a colony of this kind. Now, it's not alone. There are lots of other places nearby that also have strong Egyptian material culture for this phase, uh, and basically virtually nothing of the local Levantine material culture. Right, that's just a nice picture. Until I stack up. From above. So one of these other major sites is Enbessor. This is probably a staging post along the routes, that, the trading routes that they were using at the time. It's one of these places where you see a lot of Egyptian material culture. And its location connected with uh, a source of water is probably just it was a good place to stop when you're having your, moving your caravans along, good place to feed your animals and to get some water for yourself as you are traveling along <laughs> these trade routes. But it was very tiny. There was only about 12 men, they estimate, being based in an vessel. And one of the roles they seemingly had on this route was to you know, put the seals on some of the items being moved along. Because during excavations, they found 60 bags of unbaked clay. And these had first dynasty seal impressions upon them. We also have Tel <coughs> Manaz, I'll say that, which was basically a campsite, a very tiny site once again. Something not really significant, but a place the Egyptians seemed to be stopping at as they moved along. Similarly, nearby, very, very close to Tel Asakan, you have Tor <coughs> This would have once again have been a very tiny, small community. And it's so close to Tel Sakan there is probably some sort of satellite community that was connected with the major administrative center that the Egyptians were using at Sakan. <coughs> and nearby, just beyond the field of these primarily Egyptian sites, you have Tel Aram. <coughs> this is another location that people associated with Egyptians and Egyptian material culture for a while perhaps was at one point regarded as part of this colony, if you will. But really, at Tel Arani, you find still more 
the Levantine culture than Egyptian material. So it seems to have been a typically Levantine uh, settlement there, but a place where there was Egyptian staying there for long periods of time. So it points to uh, frequent visitors at least, a quick stop on this trade route, or a place where you might have long-term residents from the long-term Egyptian residents. <coughs> Now, if you want to look at this as an overview of what they were doing there, there seems to be no real evidence that the Egyptians were involved in any sort of warfare at this time. There is no evidence that they were going there and militarily dominating the people of the Levant. There's no arrowheads, for example, found in the excavations. So it does suggest that trade was their main purpose. They were seeking, as we mentioned before, things like wine, olive oil, copper, cattle, wood, and even human labor. But by the end of the First Dynasty, the presence in the Levant decreases incredibly dramatically. Now, why did this happen? It just seemed to be uh, that these local city-states in the south of the Levant started well, becoming more independent, growing in authority, uh, becoming more fortified, and the Egyptians, too, decided, it seems, to start traveling by sea instead. So why travel through the southern, southern Levant? Why have these colonies? When you can simply just sail up the, across the Mediterranean there up to the source of what you want in the north. It also is at the same time, a time of increased military hostility against the southern Levant. But in general, it seems, Across the early dynastic period, you start seeing the Egyptians being far more aggressive, not just to the southern Levant, but also to Nubia as well. And so the people who were really their, um, I suppose, their allies beforehand, suddenly become their enemies and people they want to attack. We do get quite a bit of evidence for warfare in the Levant during the early dynastic period. For example, just to pick one example here, this ivory label of death shows a king smiting an Indian captive and is described as the first time of smiting the Easterners. Well, of course, as always with this type of material, it could just simply be ideological propaganda. But the trade did continue, despite all of these things, especially lots of copper uh, items start being found on excavations from this time. So too, S3471, that's Kara from the reign of Jer. You have about 700 copper objects in this tube about 75 copper ingots <coughs> as well. And as any of you will know, there were lots and lots of copper items found in the tomb of Kasakhemu. And it's in this late time, the late pre-dynastic and the early dynastic as well, worth mentioning that you start going a lot of long distance trade. So this is a very wide network that the Egyptians are part of. Just to pick an example, Tomb 11, the Hierocompolis, dated into the Nagaba III period. You get lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, possibly Iran. You get silver barrel beads from eastern Anatolia. You get turquoise from Sinai. And obsidian blades that are either from Ethiopia or Anatolia, although I was reading that it seems from some of the more scientific studies that the obsidian probably does come from Ethiopia. That's probably the main source of this at this time. I'll just put it here because I think it's pretty. The earliest large lapis lazuli object that we get. It's this lovely statuette from Hierocompolis, now we're in the Ashmolean Museum. Quite unlike anything else, there are no real parallels to it. And so people suggest that it might have been a foreign import. Now, I did say that we cover in the north and the south and the pre dynastic, so we're going to rewind time now and go back to the beginning of the pre dynastic period. And start looking south. And we're going to focus a bit more on the Nagardans, Nagardians if you want, and the Nubian A group, this other culture that was around at this time. So the Nubian A group, for those who don't know, they roughly <coughs> lived in the area of the first and second cataracts from around 3700 to about 2800 BC. Over this phase, over this time, they moved slowly further and further south. So they started roughly in the vicinity of Aswan and carried on going south, and they ended their days roughly in the area of the second cataract. And early on, it's very clear that the, what we call the A group, 
and the Magadha Egyptians uh, were very similar origins. As early as the Magadha one time, the earliest A group phases have virtually indistinguishable pottery. So you couldn't tell the difference between what we would class as Magadha one and the early A group vessels. There's a lot of cultural <coughs> uniformity at this very early time. But as the fourth millennium progresses, you start getting separation. So they diverge over this time and become more individual in their cultural materials. But despite this, despite the fact that slowly they change in geography and slowly di uh, diversify in their material cultures, you do get lots of interactions going on between the Nubians, of course, and the Egyptians, the Nagada Egyptians. So we get a group pottery, this Nubian pottery, this far north as quite far into northern Upper Egypt. So they are sending things far north into Upper Egypt. At the same time, you also get a group settlements north of Aswan, so that we would regard as Egyptian territory. So there is an overlap in this time between the two, what we think as two cultures. And even further than that, too, we have a grave 51B2, which was found at Abu Sir al Malik in Middle Egypt. You have this cemetery there, and you have a single circular grave. Now, this is unusual there, but it is quite normal in Nubia and Upper Egypt. And it also contained Nubian grave goods. And so, the fact that it had Nubian grave goods, the fact that it's circular, <laughs> this Nubian style, perhaps indicates that it belonged to a Nubian immigrant who had travelled as far as Middle Egypt in this early phase in Egyptian history. And you get uh, cultural interaction going the other way too. So it's suggested that these cattle burials that you get in elite cemeteries at Hierocomplus, it's suggested that these uh, were influenced by Nubian agro practices. You find a lot of this type of thing going on at Kustul in Nubia. This is a site that's very important in the agro. It's uh, where you get these kind of massive, really rich cemeteries, potentially of rulers for the agro. And so they seem to have been sharing ideas with the Egyptians as well. And there's lots of evidence for Trekker. So the graves of this late Agru people, particularly the ones at Kustul, near Abu Simba, so I should say, that's where it is, um, they get a lot of important Egyptian artifacts, so particularly pottery, but also stone vessels as well, such as these that you see at the bottom here. You also get the Rekia nice heads, even a copper spearhead. These are all Egyptian imports that found in cemetery L in Kustul. Of course, this type of copper object will have had to have been traded via the Levant. And to emphasize how far these transport, these, these trade networks go, well, you do get Levantine type jokes as well. Now, as you probably know, in about 2800 BC, the A group completely vanished. Effectively, there is no Nubian population in, in Lower Nubia then until about 2400 BC in the later Old Kingdom. And this is possibly because of Egyptian raids. As I was saying earlier, you get uh, seemingly increased hostility by the Egyptians in the early dynastic period. They seem to become very aggressive towards people who used the friends. But until this point, even across the fourth millennium, even though the A group were separating further south and they're developing their own material culture and individual identities, you do still see throughout this entire phase a lot of cultural similarities. They're, they're intertwined <coughs> culturally in the gardens and the A, a group uh, Nubians. And it's only from this point that you get a lot of serious separation between what is Egyptian and what is Nubian. After this point, when Lower Nubia has been depopulated seemingly by the Egyptian activities there. Now it's often said, no, I'll it here, that the Egyptians seem to have removed so many cattle uh, and people as well, that it potentially they who destroyed the economy, destroyed the populations of the A group in Lower Nubia. We have this reference from the time of Sneferu from the Palermo Stone that talks about 7,000 captives being taken and 200,000 cattle. Now the Egyptians did quite like to exaggerate when they were doing this type of accounting, so we don't know if we can take it at face value, but if it is anywhere near accurate, then that's quite a lot of people and quite a lot of cattle. And if this was going on quite regularly, then you can see how they were completely decimated Lower Nubian. But 
Beyond this time, we're heading kind of into the Old Kingdom, roughly now. We do start getting still Nubians in Egypt, and perhaps we can regard these as people from Upper Nubia. But there's some, some references to them knocking around. So, this steely from Helwan, a guy called Sisi, it's late second uh, dynasty, so late early dynastic period, or, or early third dynasty, so just heading into the Old Kingdom. Now, if we look at Sisi over here, you can see the unusual hair, that's one thing, but it's the armlets that perhaps indicate the origins. As we'll see in a second, this armlet, or these armlets that you get on some of these figures, they do seem to indicate Upper Nubian styles, so suggest that Sisi was a Nubian from Upper Nubia living in Egypt. From a similar date, from the second or third dynasty, we also get Burial 7, Shala, just south of Elephantini. And this is quite unusual. To list what was found on this body, well, you get two copper objects. There was an elaborate gold necklace being worn by the body. <coughs> there were small bracelets on one wrist. And perhaps the most important part, each arm was adorned with these V-shaped armlets made from ivory. And this is what perhaps indicates he was of high status. You see, that's the image of the grave over here. On the far left, this is an image of what is thought to be a Nubian from the Moultrie Temple of Sahure, 5th Dynasty. Now, this individual is taken from a scene of various prisoners in a row uh, being dragged before the king, as they typically are. Except that he's quite unusual, because he's got his arms raised, whereas the others have their arms bound. As you can see, he's got this type of V-shaped armlet on, which is very, very similar to the one being worn by this guy, <coughs> Shala. Now, that might not mean everything, not mean anything at all, but you see a similar armlet being worn by a Nubian in another scene from Sahurae's Motri Temple as well. In that scene, you have the king as a sphinx trampling upon the leaders of the enemies of the foreign lands. So you have a Libyan and Asiatic <coughs> leader. You also have a Nubian leader being crushed by the king. And this Nubian leader being crushed has this V-shaped style of armlet. So it's perhaps an indication that whoever wears that type of armlet is a ruler. It's an argument. It doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but it's an interesting point. So when people think about this Shalal guy, it's possible that he was an upper Nubian, who maybe was a trading boy, someone reasonably important, who died unexpectedly in Egypt during a trading mission. Or if people are right that it's a symbol of importance and rule, then perhaps this guy could even be an upper Nubian ruler who died in Egypt. Far more evidence too for Nubians living in Egypt, in the Old Kingdom, but they are quite scattered. So for example, in the 5th dynasty, in tombs of Giza, we have references to Nubians working as servants. We also have a guy called Niak Knum in the 6th dynasty, he was the supervisor of the Nubians in the great house. And there are, there's a sixth dynasty text that indicates that Nubians were also living at this time in the vicinity of Sneferu's pyramids at Dashur. And so, given the location and the reference we have from the Palermo stone of Sneferu taking all these Nubians out of Nubia, it could be that these people living there are the descendants of these Nubians who were taken to Egypt with this king. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that they did work in some way on the pyramid projects there. Similarly, in the third year of Uzukas, we have reference to 303 so-called acculturated Nubians living in Egypt, as well as 70 female foreigners being brought to work at the pyramid of Uzukas. What I mean by it's a possibility at least that the Nubians taken under Sneferu may be worked in the herd there. And there's a similar reference from the time of Pepi the First as well, which refers to once again this culturated Nubians being sent to work on a project, but I think that in either the text is damaged at that point, so it's not quite clear what the project is. Now turning back to the box. 
seems that generally in, in the Old Kingdom, the Southern Levant was pretty much left alone by the Egyptians. We know that there were fortified cities growing in this area, and some of them were built on top of these previously Egyptian uh, colony settlements. So Tel Sakam, for example, seems to have been taken over by local people in the Levant and continued to be used by these individuals after the Egyptians have left them. And generally, there are a few Southern Levantine objects in Egypt at this time, and similarly the other way around, a few <coughs> Egyptian objects in the Southern Levant. So what we really get as far as the contacts with this area go at this time is just some quite infrequent military campaigns, what seem to be in the raids on some of the fortified settlements there in the south. Which is why you get nice pictures like this, such as the one from Inti and the Shasha. Egyptians attacking fortresses, which seemingly are in the southern Levant. Taking prisoners and so forth. And there are some descriptions of these activities as well. The best known, just to mention it briefly, is the one of Weni from the Sith dynasty, which talks about fighting sand dwellers on the southern Levantine coastline. And it's at this time that you get you know, Manubians and Libyans acting as mercenaries too, and this has been going on for quite some time by this point. And generally, as usual at this time, it's basically a response against the threat to the flow of trade. The Egyptians want to keep everything under control across the Levant as much as possible. Now, it's not my aim to talk about military campaigns, because they're always talked about. As I said, I'm trying to talk about new stuff and uh, mainly also trading relations. Now, as we saw earlier on, the Egyptians don't have so much interest down here, but they do start now focusing up here, in the north of the Levant, and particularly with Biblos, this major trading partner, excellent place to go get your wood from. Now, it becomes a major friend at this point, although they probably have already been dealing with Biblos since the Val Nagar too, so much earlier on in the pre-dynastic period. What's fun about Biblos in this time is that we now have, in the past few years, was published a nice text from the Sixth Dynasty. It gives an account of a guy called Ini, who spent quite a lot of time trading with the Northern Levant, and going to Biblos and places like this. This was found on various blocks that were in Japan, and so they were translated and published quite recently after being discovered in a museum. And they quite nicely give us a lot more information about trade at this time. Before texts like this, before some of the recent studies of some of the Old Kingdom material, it was quite shadowy, the relations between Egypt and the Levant at this time. We obviously suspected stuff was going on, that there were trade relations with the Northern Levant, but there wasn't a lot of actual evidence to prove it very far until you can start finding things like this. So Inni, what does he say? Well, he does relate that he traveled to a bunch of different places. One is called Amau, was one called Ketisha, which is probably Lebanon, and a place called Pawez something. That's broken. And he did this four times under Pepi I. So this happened quite a bit. He brought the king's silver, other goods from these places as well. So this wasn't unusual, it seems. There was lots of connections going on with the Northern Levant. But not just under him. Under King Merenre, he then led three boats to Biblos as well. Here, when he went traveling, he picked up some lapis lazuli, some lead, tin, silver, oil called sevech, and some other commodities as well. And he brought these back to the king, who rewarded him with gold. But he goes on, this is what I mean about it being so detailed and so frequent. <coughs> and he then, under Pepi II, went to Kentisha again. This time he returned, he says, with his own boat and a number of cargo ships. So they were bringing lots of material back, loaded with silver. But this time it also mentions Asiatic men and women, so people to be used as labor back in Egypt. But this time, in return, he was allowed to sit near the king <coughs> when eating a cod, which doesn't seem like that very different. <laughs> a reward for the previous ones, but hey, whatever he liked, I suppose. I'm sure the king was a lovely guy to chat with. <laughs> as far as the people from Biblos coming to Egypt go, there is some evidence of that going on, but I think this is the only example I can think of. 
that in the Khufu Pyramid Cemetery, there's a lintel, uh, one, two, that's inscribed for the Man of Biblos, or Wenchet. But I think, as far as I'm aware, that's the only reference to a guy from Biblos living in Egypt at this time. Now we get some nice scenes from Sahuray's funerary temple. I've mentioned Sahuray in course earlier on too. There's a line of information. So this funerary temple shows boats returning from Biblos, so it emphasizes these connections. So it's things like this that led us to be aware, of course, that these sort of trading ventures were going on, as well as the fact that we had wood from Biblos so this in the Old Kingdom. But we also know that the first mission of Punt was under Sahuray as well. <coughs> Now this was known for quite some time because it's mentioned on the Palermo stone. But again, talking about new discoveries, in the last years there was uh, more material found of the Sahure uh, Mortuary Temple and Causeway and all of this, and it showed extra scenes depicting relations with Punt from Sahura. So previously we had the Palermo stone and it simply said that in one of the years about 80,000 units of antiu, this type of incense, and quantities of electrum as well as some other commodities that we can't quite understand, uh, were brought to Egypt from Punt. I, should, I suppose I should mention as well that Punt is this place that we're not quite sure of where it is yet. It's somewhere along the Red Sea coastline, probably Eritrea, something like this. But we get scenes like this now, and these were recently published, just to emphasize uh, the relations with Punt that Sahu Ray was seemingly beginning. So we have him celebrating the return of these frankincense trees from Punt. And a nice image of him with them, seemingly taking some of the resinous gum from the tree. Now this makes Hatshepsut a liar, I'm afraid to say, sorry to her, because she says that I think that she's the first person to bring trees back from Punt, I think she says, in the Montreux Temple there. Well, Sahura says otherwise, I'm afraid. And we get other scenes too, things like this. The procession, the king and queen, the boats arriving back from Punt. And this is all new and very exciting to see. Now turning west, I did say I talk a bit about Libya, the western desert. In the early dynastic period, <coughs> there are occasional interactions between Libyan groups and the Egyptians, sporadic expeditions it would seem as well, into the desert out there, but not really that much. It seems the Egyptians at the time thought there was little worth exploiting in the western desert, they were making worth their effort to go out there. They did seem to want to control the oases a bit, probably from these Libyan groups, just to kind of ensure their own security. We know there was a site west of Armant, which was a place very early on for the Egyptians to meet people crossing from the Western Desert, and was a location where, seemingly, you exchanged cattle. And from the same location, from Amat, this was the main route for the Egyptians to travel to Dakla Oasis via Kaga. This was a typical route. Because it was Dakla, which is where you find the main Old Kingdom uh, settlements of the Old Kingdom. This is where you find the Egyptians being present in the Western Desert. But it does seem that Bahareya had some sort of population as well. We have texts from Dakla that mention people of Bahareya Oasis being brought into the Dakla workforce to deliver goods and work on building projects and so forth. So it seems that there was, although very little evidence exists for it, people living at least in Bahareya as well as Dakla. As far as Kaga goes in the Old Kingdom, it seems it was just used as a stopping off point, a place to uh, have a rest while you were travelling across the desert towards Dakla. Now, in comparison to all these other <laughs> oases, we do have quite a few different places that in Dakla that the Egyptians were occupying. The main one being this pair of seal, Balat, here. We get those very large mustavas at the end of the uh, 6th dynasty. And they were here from, it seems, as early as the 4th dynasty. Now, the reason that Dakla was of particular importance to the Egyptians of the Old Kingdom is because of this trade. <laughs> that headed off into the southwest. Dakla uh, was a major hub on what they now call the Abu Balas Trail, 
this series of stops uh, that goes all the way down. A two week long journey so far, but I know 400 kilometers that will go into the Gilkbeer region, heading down that way. Basically, in a straight diagonal way down here. And then probably continued onwards, either to the Gibbal Ulat, further down here, perhaps even further to the southwest, so Kufra Oasis or into Chad. This was a long, long network. Now, along the route, just to make sure you didn't get lost, there were various staging posts, 30 that they know of, that were marked by this type of large cairn, these loose stones that have been piled up so you can follow the route. Along the way, they also left large pottery jars. These were dug into the ground, and they were very, very big. They could hold about 30 litres of water each. And other jars, too, stopped drains. So you were well prepared on this journey. You weren't going to die in the desert. They would look after you. And to make sure that this water was okay and that the grain wasn't licked or anything like this, it seems that people were staying in some of these major outposts. They would have looked after these very supplies to ensure that the caravans coming from the southwest were, you know, that they, they'd have provisions available to them. And it seems that these individuals manning these posts, as you would assume, got quite bored over time. And so you see images being carved for the rocks and including a senate board, such as the one you find there past the time while I waited for people to come travelling along bringing goods. And we get letters that reflect this type of uh, relationship with the Southwest as well. So one mentions the coming of a chief of Deniu, translated as the village of the island, and that grain should be provided for this guy along the way. So reference to these places along the Abu Balas Trail, it would seem. Now Demiu, it is argued, is possibly Gebel Uanat, with its chief occupying the site during the rainy season. So it's not a place you could stay all the time, but at a certain time of year you could use the site. Of course, this is guesswork. Okay, so moving into the Middle Kingdom. I'm sure we're all aware uh, of the wonderful scenes Khnumhotep II, the Asiatic caravan from Samosa of the Second, year six. But one of these recently translated texts comes from the time of Khnumhotep III, this guy's son, because it wasn't simply him who was involved in interactions with foreigners. Khnumhotep III's account was translated recently by James Allen. This is from a tomb at Dashur. And he gives us lots of great information about Egypt's relationship with the northern Levant at this time. <coughs> Things of which previously we weren't really aware of. So, for example, from this inscription of Khnumhotep III, it seems that for at least the early part of the Middle Kingdom, the Top Dynasty, it was not Biblos that was the major trading partner in the northern Levant with the Egyptians. In fact, instead, it was a place called Ulaza, which was 50 kilometers further north. Now, from this text, it seems that the rulers of Biblos at this time were quite aggressive to the Egyptians. We have Khnumhotep describes going to Ulaza to trade for cedar. For some reason, it's not entirely clear why, he ends up stopping at Biblos. When he gets there, a man called Amalku, obviously connected to the Malek king, starts questioning. Khnumhotep III. While he's there, it seems to it's very broken. The text is very fragmentary. But it seems to be that uh, the army of Byblos is on a mission to attack Balaza at this time. And as you would expect, with the Egyptians being allies, it would seem, with Balaza, that when the pharaoh gets wind of this, he isn't particularly pleased and decides to send an army to sort things out. So it could be connected with this kind of growth in relations between the Egyptians and Byblos in the later Middle Kingdom. Is this why 
earlier on, we have very little information about Egypt's relation with Biblos. Is it because it was controlled in the earlier phases by people aggressive to the Egyptians? And it's only after the pharaoh sent someone to sort them out during this Milaza affair that afterwards we start hearing the rulers of Biblos being quite Egyptianized. It's only in the later Middle Kingdom, for example, when you start getting them referred to as Hatia, the Egyptian word for governor. This increased Egyptianization only occurs later in the 12th dynasty. So is it due to these events, of which we now have a nice description of, thanks to Knemont III? Because it's after this time that we start hearing things like this, these lovely gifts that were found in the tombs of the rulers of Biblos. And these typically, well, they date from Amenemhat III and from Amenemhat IV, so after these events described by Knemont III. It's also at this time that you start bearing the, what they call the pseudo hieroglyphic script, this you know, very short lived but clearly Egyptian inspired um, uh, script that the people of Biblos were using, which is still currently untranslated. So if any of you have some spare time at the weekend or you've got nothing else to do, give it a go. <laughs> you might succeed. You'd be really famous like Champollion. Great. Really helpful to me. <laughs> and this gives us lots of really great information about the Egyptians' relations with the Levant from the time of the Second. So we have reference to the dispatch of an expeditionary force, an army, to Asia, Septjet, and to destroy a place there which is called Liao. And some people have argued that this could be in Turkey. And possibly, if it is, the Egyptian army is going a very long way away. Another section mentions the return of, an, of the army as well and talks about them along the way attacking other fortifications as well. well among them a place called the Assi, which again, some people have argued, could be a city in Cyprus. <coughs> yeah, there's no clear evidence for this, for it is an argument. There's no evidence I can think of on Cyprus to indicate this was going on, but there you go. What's significant is that it talks about 1,554 Asiatic captives being brought back by the army shows the sheer numbers of individuals the Egyptians were bringing back from this type of raid and then having to settle in Egypt. And some of these seemingly went to work on Amenemhat the Second's pyramid. In return, the Egyptians got slaves, field, and gold, and clothing, and beautiful things. But it goes on. More references to interactions with individuals. We have the ten power people who are perhaps Bedouin, who are said to be with bowed heads bringing 238 ingots of lead to the Egyptian court. And there's further references too with these interactions. There's an expeditionary force that was sent to the Lebanon, to Kenti Shell. These are said to have departed in two boats, later returned with 1,675.5 <coughs> Devon of silver, 4,892 Devon of copper, and, oh sorry, I should change that, I think it's well, some of them must be gold, I assume, and then 15,961 Devon of copper. And as well as 65 male and female Asiatics. So more individuals being brought in. And then, even more. So the princes of Asia are said to come to the Egyptian court, and with them, they bring 1,002 Asiatics, as well as silver and lead domestic animals. So we've got this idea, that even just in the reign of Amenemhat II, lots of people from uh, the Asiatic areas are being brought into Egypt and settled. And it's from the time of Amenemhat II too that we get the told treasure. This incredibly rich amount of objects. Rings, bracelets, a mirror, copper, over 150 shallow bowls, pendants, carnelian beads, <coughs> bronze, quartz, amethyst, obsidian. A whole collection of things that seem to have been brought from different locations uh, across the Mediterranean world and collected together for this single treasure. Basically it amounts to about seven kilograms of gold, nine kilograms of silver at least, and just the copper chests that they were found in weigh 120 kilograms. So a very rich amount of goods. Again, as I say, collected seemingly from around the Mediterranean world. Items from the Aegean, possibly Anatolia, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, as well as so far-flung locations. It's possible that some of these missions that we were just describing on the uh, annals of Amenemhat II, perhaps this is when some of these items were collected, when they were sailing around. 
the Mediterranean coastline and gathering goods up for the cot. It's a possibility. I thought I'd throw this in simply because it's a Petri, uh, Friends of the Petri Lecture. This was on the Facebook page, I think, about six months ago or so. A small bead from the Indus culture, probably made about 2000 BC. It's the oldest Indian object found in Egypt. And it was found in a Middle Kingdom tomb and is in the building just across the road. <laughs> so it's come a long way. So as we've seen, there were a lot of people of Asiatic descent ending up in Egypt during the Middle Kingdom. It must have been quite a large population over time. And because of this, you start seeing them more and more in art. So this is a nice statuette made from wood in the National Museum of Scotland. Seemingly of an Asiatic woman. Notice she has a little baby at her back as well. Yep. See it more clearly there. And a hole in the head as well. It seems to be a normal feature for this type of statuette. You get one on this one too. Another one of a foreigner, this time in Boston. A bit more detailed, seemingly quite a heavy woolen garment that she's wearing. Same type of mushroom shaped uh, herdu with a band around it. And again, a little hole in the top. And the argument is that these little holes were probably the cones sort of uh, decorative comb that might have been worn by these individuals and of course since been lost. <laughs> and we start seeing more foreign women, Asiatics, appearing in tomb scenes as well. So for example here the tomb of Bukhota the third of Mir. You get these kind of mushroom shaped hairstyles that we can see on the statuettes. Okay, side two over here. So you're seeing these foreign individuals becoming more and more commonly depicted because they are an increasing part of society over the Middle Kingdom. This is a stele from Liverpool. It has the Asiatic sober Iri throwing grain with one of his hands, working on the land here. Other Asiatics are also described. One of them is involved in the brewing process with the beer. Similarly, on this stele here, from the vizier Reni Sene, 13th dynasty, we have an Asiatic woman on the stele. She's called Sene Reni Sene. You can see her in more detail here. And this really was quite normal at this time. For if you had an Asiatic servant, you normally find um, the kind of order of the estate's name made as part of this individual. So the, old, the vizier was Reni Sene. She is Sene Reni Sene. simply described as the Asiatic. And you also get images like this from the Sinai, of Asiatics being involved in some of the expeditions that are going on. And this is the reign of Amenhotep III. You, see, you sometimes get described some of the quite important individuals helping the Egyptians during this type of expedition. And quite un-Egyptian, I suppose, in the scenes, you have the guy riding a donkey here, which you don't normally see Egyptians doing in the art. And just because it's a pretty painting of the scene, the scene from Beni Hassan to 14, the Asiatic woman, again, like the statues with a baby at her back, and now it seems to be quite a funky head. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes on, just to show you a couple of extra examples. This is a stele of Minhotep in uh, Florence. What's significant about this one is that the Asiatic is described and then kind of depicted slightly. Underneath the chair of the Steleona here, we zoom in. So we have them there. And this was a private place. On the other side, you have the daughter of the family being mentioned under the wife's chair. So this Asiatic must have had some significance to the owner of the Stele, enough to at least be mentioned in an important location. We also get lots of references to Asiatics turning up in Kairai as well, particularly from La Hun. In La Hun, we have Asiatics in Medje, for example, outnumbering the Egyptians in temple dancing jobs. So although 
the uh, foreigners weren't actually involved in the sort of serious cultic roles in the temples. They were doing other things in the village, in the town. We also have Paris, Brooklyn, 35446, which has quite a lot of references to Asiatic servants and servants in general. In total, this document refers to 95 servants working on this estate, of which 45 are Asiatics, and in which women outnumber the men three to one. Now, this is quite a lot of servants, and I think it's Stephen Quirk who argued that this actually might be an estate owned by a vizier, and that's why there are so many servants here mentioned. It's not a normal thing. <coughs> now, most of the adults mentioned in this text are both Semitic and Egyptian names. They come in two columns, the Egyptian name and the original Asiatic Semitic name. In fact, only five of the adults, all of the children, have Egyptian names only. And this is interesting. It's possible that maybe the individuals that were being used as servants here were taken during quite recent raid, it would seem. That's why some of them kept their Semitic names and they're still known by them, but they had Egyptian names as well. And it's only you know, like people like the children, people who would have been born since, that were only given Egyptian names, but they didn't, they didn't bother giving them Semitic names. At the same time, the reason there might be more women than men is perhaps because during that raid, most of the men were killed from the location they took the prisoners. So more women might have been left behind to be brought back as servants. And we know the various roles that were being played by these Asiatics on this estate. One was a house servant, one was a brewer, there were cooks, tutors or guardians of children as well. Most of the women mentioned are cloth makers. There was also a maid servant, magazine employees, and also a laborer as well. So lots of varied roles played by these Asiatics here. As far as Nubians go in Egypt during the Middle Kingdom, we do have this quite nice steel, Anket Neni, this 12th dynasty, and it's actually owned by a person who's captioned as the Nubian woman. She's wearing a little short wig. Now, for her to have a steely like this, she must have been quite an important individual, but also very proud of her roots and heritage. So it's quite an unusual case. We also have an example of a person from Punt living in Egypt as well from this time. The steely dead Sobek in Cairo. I think it's the only reference uh, to a servant from Punt, at least that I'm aware of, and a, a servant from Punt living in Egypt. And this is this person who's broken off at the back here, who is described as the female servant of Punt, Sat Mesuti, where it does break a lot, so it's entirely clear. It's the only one, and if you know of any more, I'd be quite appreciative if you'd let me know. Okay, just to finish off with, I wanted to quickly mention Crete and the Minoans, because I wanted to emphasize just how widespread the Egyptian contacts were with the outside world. From the start of the Middle Kingdom, we do find quite a lot of connections early on with Crete. We have scarabs, we have fires, we have stone vessels. And some of these are imported, and some of them are local Minoan um, imitations. But it shows that the Minoans were having at least enough contact with the Egyptians and their material culture to make these copies. We have interesting things like this happening. The goddess Tawarat, this important household goddess to the Egyptians, is seemingly assimilated into Minoan religion. We start finding her being associated with water and sacred stones among the Minoans and depicted on Minoan scarabs. We also have this potter's wheel that was found in Malia in Crete. I'm not too sure about this one, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It's quite an interesting looking one, and it's argued that from the scene of, scene of tomb, the tomb of Amenemhat in the Middle Kingdom, Beli Hassan, that perhaps these stripes down here are representing the same sort of thing you see here, and that maybe this has inspired this type of uh, object has inspired this. Yeah, maybe you're pushing it a bit far, but it's interesting to say. At the same time, in Egypt, from Samuel's room first, you have the tomb of Hef Jetha, and the ceiling seems to be inspired by Minoan art. So it could be a nice example of Minoan influence heading to Egypt 
for these sort of four patterns. We also have a Sphinx from Malia, 12th Dynasty, and it's meant to be the earliest example of a Sphinx found in Crete. Potentially Egyptian influenced, it seems to have a little Osirian beard as well. There's also, looking back into Egypt, and the Nelms coming there, there seems to be quite a bit of Minoan pottery knocking around in the Middle Kingdom. You find it on the Hun, Wider Slish to Haraga, Kupital Hawa, but the most is found in the region of Lahon and Haraga. Totals about 31 vessels of Minoan origin that were found at the site. It's argued that these probably entered Egypt as a form of palatial exchange, that silverware from, the, from Crete might have been brought and given to people like the king and the highest elite. Remember, of course, at this time, you do have the royal court in this region. And that maybe some very fine ceramics of this type that we have here uh, was given to people slightly lower down the hierarchy. So not the highest elite, but the type of gifts you would give to people a little lower down. And this is what we're finding the remains of. So, my overall thoughts from all this, which you can probably put together yourself, that before the New Kingdom, these trade networks are very widespread. Egypt had a really uh, serious amount of interactions with the outside world, especially with foreigners generally, and not just foreigners that they were going to meet or trading and traveling around, but people who were coming to Egypt and seemingly living there from a very early on, so in the very formative stages of Egyptian history at Mahdi. From the very beginning, you have interconnections going on, people exchanging ideas and goods, technology. And these people are there, living in Egypt, on a very early date. Now all of this must have had a very strong influence on Egyptian culture and the other cultures knocking around too at the time. And that, although Egypt, when we're looking at it, looking at the Egyptian texts in times too, seems to be just what we see here, this very uh, enclosed land that the Semitic neighbors called it, this place that was hard to get into. But even from the earliest stages of Egyptian history, it was actually part of a much wider world, and always has been. And that's that. <laughs>